Reggie Miller, the Hall of Famer, Turner Sports NBA analyst. Reg will be on the call for the Jazz and the Nuggets Thursday night at 1030 Eastern, along with Ali LaForce and, of course, Kevin Harlan doing play-by-play. Reg, sorry, I uh, realized that Uncle Drew did not get nominated for any Academy Awards. <laughs> Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. Uh, look, we were very disappointed, obviously, in the Uncle Drew camp. At least for makeup, we should have been nominated for for those two and a half, three hours in that makeup chair, getting all those prosthetics put on, to the least have counted for something. Um, I, look, I, my best Daniel Day Lewis, you know, acting for that month and a half. I, I just don't know what the what the Academy was thinking. Okay, I mean, but you, Reg, on, you weren't obviously. you weren't wearing makeup. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Do you think I look? I look like I'm 35 or 53. So it took a lot of makeup to make me look like I did in Uncle Drew. Kyrie, but, uh, congratulations, Kyrie. Congrat, congratulations to my nemesis in Spike Lee. Um, I I hit him. I told him, look, I know we've always had our different philosophies in terms of our basketball acumen and who we root for but there is no denying his eye for filmmaking and it's been long overdue 20 years in my um, estimation of him winning an oscar i thought he should have gotten one for malcolm x um, but that's just my personal opinion but good though good things come to those who wait so congratulations spike yeah, I think Malcolm X was maybe the best movie that he ever did. Uh, Do the Right Thing certainly got a lot of headlines. I don't know if America was ready to embrace, celebrate, do the right thing at the time. And that's when uh, Driving Miss Daisy ended up winning. You know, so you talk about polar opposites of impact. Uh, I, I, I think Spike did an amazing job with Do the Right Thing. I just don't know if the Academy was ready to embrace the movie at that time. Well, they're embracing him now, and uh, kudos for that. Um, I, I really think his acceptance speech was fabulous. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the purple suit. Um, well, that was a tribute shoes, to Prince. Well, that, was, that was for Prince. I know, I know, I know. But the shoes were on point. Those Jordans were <laughs> fly. So um, kudos. All right. Uh, LeBron James says that, uh, you know, these younger players have to have a sense of urgency here. Here is LeBron talking about excuses <laughs> for the Lakers. Then I'll get your opinion. I know it's going to be very challenging um, just because of the uh, the experience that, you know, the roster had at that point in time. Um, you know, I knew it was going to be challenging from that sense, but I felt like we, we could still play, you know, better basketball. Um, and we was doing that. And obviously, you know, it sucks that my injury happened and Zoe's injury happened and so many of our injuries had. We had suspensions. We had. So, you know, I'm, I'm so huge in, like, chemistry and camaraderie and throughout the course of the season through injuries and suspensions. That happened early. That's whatever with that. But the injuries have, you know, like it's taken a toll on our team. All right, he's talking about camaraderie here. He's talking about these kids, you know, they don't understand the urgency here. How would you feel if you're a teammate of LeBron's right now that you – were one of the people who was going to be traded, and now, you know, you don't have a sense of urgency here. He, he's right in the second half of his comments about the injuries. Because if you remember back, to me, the injuries really derailed them because uh, when he went down on Christmas Day with the groin injury, the Lakers were rolling. And they were up, what, 18, 20 points up to that injury and found a way to hang on and beat the champs in their building on Christmas day, but then he misses 18 or 19 games. And we see what the, the LeBron young Lakers are without their superstar. But to his point, you know, he wants these young guys to grow up. It was just a week and a half, 10 days ago, you know, two weeks that all of these young kids were on the trading blocks. And you've got to think of it like this. How would you feel? You are playing with, the best player in their generation, these young cats, these young guys, Kuzma, uh, Ball, Ingram, they probably had LeBron James poster while they were younger. They idolize this guy. Now they get a chance to play with him. And you can say what you want. It's Magic Palinga running the team. LeBron, because of his power, is running the Lakers. I know people don't want to hear that, but he is. Yeah. And all these guys were on the auction block. They were all being shipped 
for Anthony Davis to New Orleans. So you're a 22, 23-year-old guy, and one moment we're on the chopping block and we're going to be out of here, and the next moment, turn around, you want to slain hard, and we've got to focus in, and we've got to do better. Um, So this is what these young guys are going through. Generational-type best player in their generation, these young cats. And next, I'm on the training block, and now now that – it didn't go down. You want us to play hard. 22, 23, 24-year-old, they, they can't recover from this. They, it, it's going to be very difficult for them to hone in. They can do it because of the greatness of LeBron, but it's, it's certainly going to be a lot. And they have to stay healthy. Everyone has to stay healthy for this, what, 22, 23-game stretch that's getting ready to come up for them. Do you think it's better for the Lakers to make the playoffs as the eighth team or miss and be in the lottery? Miss and be in the lottery. What good is making the eighth other than, you know, boasting the Hall of Fame career already of uh, LeBron? Um, to me, if they can find a way to go on a stretch and get to the seventh, now we're talking. Because other than Golden State in the West, if I'm the Lakers with LeBron and the healthy LeBron and Rondo, playoff Rondo, as I call him. I'll go against anyone in the West other than that eighth seed in the Golden State Warriors because Denver, as good and talented and young, and I love the Joker and Paul Millsap, now you're getting Isaiah Thomas back. I've, I am absolutely loving what the Nuggets are doing, but I am not scared of the Nuggets come playoff time at how, all if I'm LeBron. How did the Rockets beat the Warriors without James Harden? I think – because Kevin Harlan and myself, we called that huge overtime victory that the Rockets had versus Golden State about a month and a half ago in Oracle when uh, James Harden hit that huge shot um, to basically win it. And the Warriors wanted payback, and they wanted payback versus James Harden. I think when they found out that James wasn't playing, they thought it was going to be a cakewalk. And that's why in this league, no matter who you play on any given night, I don't care the roster, you can be beat. Now, it's only one game. That wouldn't happen in the seven-game series. So I hope people are like, oh, okay, well, the Rockets can beat them. you got to beat them four times. you got to beat Golden State Warriors four times. Will they have their lapses? Yes, we've seen that. Um, they almost lost coming back after the break to Sacramento, who, in my opinion, is going to be a playoff team and plays hard. So on any given night, anyone can be beat, but can you beat a team four games? That's the big question. James Harden got hit with a $25,000 fine. He uh, criticized the official Scott Foster. Did you ever feel like you had an official who was personally out to get you? I did, not personally, but I had my run-ins with certain officials that I was Anytime I saw them on the road, I just shook my head. This wasn't going to be a, a good night, not personally for myself, maybe, or, and or for my team. Um, but for them to make it so public and for, you know, CP3 to say that he's had conversations with the league office yeah. about Scott Foster, um, there's something that's underlying here, you know, there's no way you're going to get them all in the room. And for James to come out and say that he should never, ever call a Rockets game again, you're almost forcing the league's hand on this. I understand the fine, but you can't say that about an official, that he should never, ever call a game, a Rockets game again. Um, because if I'm the league, the next three Rockets and Lakers game, I would see Scott Foster just to shove it down their throat. You can't do that. You can't dictate who the officials are. Finish this. We're talking to Reggie uh, Miller. He's got Jazz Nuggets Thursday night at 1030 Eastern. Finish this sentence. My biggest concern about lowering the draft age from 19 to 18 is what? It, it's great for the Zion Williamson and maybe R.J. Barrett of the world. Um, but I, I believe you're going to be getting, you know, two and three star blue chip players thinking that they're ready and a team drafting them for the future and they end up being bust and they end up not having the opportunity. I'm sure they can go back later and get their education, but to play college basketball, 
Uh, my four years at UCLA were unbelievable um, in that experience. The times were different back there in the 80s and early 90s. You know, I was drafted in 87. And when you came out after your junior year, you were looked like, oh, my God, this is he's coming out after his junior year. He really must be ready. And now we have guys who are 17 or 18 who are much more physically ready to play. If you look at Zion's body, I mean, he's got an NFL body. He could play in the NFL next year if he wanted to. Um, so players are much more physically ready to play in the NBA at 18. I just hope from parents and maybe however you grew up and people around you, um, push you into that NBA draft and you're not quite ready and you need a year or two or three or God forbid all four. Now you're almost frowned upon when you go to college for three or four years. Yeah. Now people think, what is wrong? What's wrong with you? Why are you doing that? I needed my four years at UCLA every summer playing with, against the Lakers and the pros that mentally got me ready for 18 years professionally. And if it wasn't for those summers playing against magic and Byron and Michael Cooper and them basically brainwashing me on how to become a professional basketball player. I don't know if I have the career that I had if it wasn't for those four years during the summer and those four years at UCLA. Yeah, I don't worry about Zion Williamson and maybe uh, R.J. Barrett or Cam Reddish. It's some of the other guys who are being told, because everybody thinks they can play in the league. You know, it, that it just you get a lot of people around you are going to tell you that and then you're going to bypass maybe one or two years in college which can get you a little more ready for the league maybe if it could be mentally you know maturing to be even you, you know a lot of them have the talent but you know you have to go in there and, and be able to be mature and handle being on the road and having money and women throwing in themselves i mean there's so much involved in it i mean you got guys yeah. who are 30 let alone 20 who have a hard time dealing with this so I don't know how many players are going to make this jump uh, out of high school. I'm fine with it. You know, I, I'm okay because we allow it in all the other sports just about, except for the NFL. And if you want to do it in the bas in uh, the NBA and that's what you think your job trait is and your skill, then fine. Go ahead. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to stand in your way. I understand why the NBA doesn't want this because you, you don't want to be babysitting a bunch of 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds here in the league. And the good thing that the NBA has done now is they have the G League, too, which I'm sure now will help promote, you know, younger players being able to, you know, two-way contracts, being able to go up and down, you know, from the big club. It's almost like a minor league system. Um, but also what we have to take into account is the financial restraint, too, of these younger kids. We don't know how they're growing up. You know, a lot of these uh, kids, at times, maybe they come from a single-parent household, they're living paycheck to paycheck, and this is the best way for them to you know, help their mom or their dad or their grandmother out. So I get it, and I understand it, and I can't fault them for that. You know, we all can't grow up with a silver spoon and have um, the financial capabilities of not needing money. A lot of these kids don't, and I understand that, and that's why the big outcry, outcry is about the NCAA is that these kids can't make money off their own likeness. Yeah. You can make an off my likeness. And that's what frustrates me about the NCAA. Reg, good to talk to you and uh, have fun Thursday night. Jazz and the Nuggets at 1030 Eastern on TNT. Thank you, Reg. Theodore, you, you are the best. Danette, I love you. And in honor of Spike Lee, we are going to do the right <laughs> thing on hey. Thursday. Thank you, Reg. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV or download the Dan Patrick Show app.